I'm still standing. I am set. Literally, that's the declarative word I have for myself today and hopefully for you. And I'm, I'm declaring that word for all of Antioch West today. We are still standing. And sometimes you got to stand even though you don't feel like you have the strength to do so. You, you got to declare in your heart and your spirit and by faith, I'm still standing. And so uh, we are declaring that today. And in Jesus' name, we've been knocked down, but we haven't been knocked out. There's a difference. You can be knocked down, but you don't have to be knocked out. And uh, there's a lot of us, all, most of us probably in some way in 2020, can say amen to the fact that we've been knocked down. But being knocked down is not the same as being knocked out. In fact, you know what? Jesus never promised you wouldn't get knocked down. He just promised you wouldn't be knocked out. And so the idea of failing is not the fact that you uh, got knocked down. There's many people that have won a fight after they got knocked down. Getting knocked down does not make you a loser. Getting knocked down does not make you a failure. It's what you do when you're knocked down that determines your success or failure. You can lay on the mat and lament your situation and go, oh, I'm so, it's just terrible. I've been knocked down again. I don't know what I'm going to do and quit. I'm going to give up. Or you can say, you know what? Count to one, count to two, count to three, count to four. But you know what's funny? The devil only has nine fingers. Just give me a minute here. Let me just have a moment. I don't get to preach much anymore. So just let me preach for about 30 seconds. The devil doesn't have... 10 fingers. He's got nine because you know what? He can't count past nine. He can stand over your life today no matter what your situation is, no matter what you're going through, no matter the difficulty you're dealing with today, and you're laying on your mat today and God been knocked down and he's, he is taunting you today. One, two, three, four, five. And he's laughing going, where is God? He's left you. Where is God? Where is all this? Where is all that God stuff now? Six. You're a failure. Seven. You're never going to be any good. Eight. It's over with. Nine. 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 Because he can't count to ten. Because you know why? Jesus eliminated the number ten when he died on the cross. Because at the cross, Jesus walked into, walked into hell and said, You know what? I'll take the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And oh, by the way, while I'm at it. Let me have the number 10 because you know what? You'll be able to get to nine, but you're never going to be able to get to 10. So thank you for the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And oh, by the way, I'll take the number 10 because you can knock me down, but you can't, be, you can't knock me out. And you know what? Today, if you're going to, de to determine your life because you've been knocked down, you don't realize who's on the throne today. If you're going to lament the fact you've been knocked down, you don't know the fact that there's a God that's on the throne today that has declared over your life today. If you're baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, you have a guarantee written in stone on the word of God, in the word of God, that he is the ultimate victor and we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And so today I may be at nine. I may be knocked down and maybe and the devil may have counted to nine. But he can't count to 10. And he wants you to think. That's the, his greatest tactic. One of his greatest tactics. Not many, but one of his greatest tactics is try to convince you he has more power than he does. It's his desire. Because you know what? The devil has power, but he doesn't have authority. Woo! I don't know why I'm getting on this today, but somebody needs to hear this encouraging word. This is not what I intended to get to today. We might get to that to the minute, in a minute. But Jesus is trying to talk to somebody just for a moment because you're looking at the wrong side of the ledger. The fact of the matter is the devil has power. Several months ago on a Tuesday talk, I talked about the difference between power and authority. There's no doubt the devil has got power. We can sit here all we want and say, well, the devil is, is he's this, he's no, no, the devil has power. There's no doubt. We can't argue that. In fact, the Bible even talks about the fact that Satan has power. We can't hide from that. So the problem is, it's like, oh, well, he has power. What do we do? 
He doesn't have authority. And on Tuesday Talks, I use this analogy, and this is a good analogy, especially for a Sunday, because in just a few minutes after we're done here today, the whistle's going to blow, and a ball's going to be kicked off, and two teams are going to play each other in the good old American game of football. And on that field, there will be 11 men on each side, all of them physical specimens of power. You have men that are 280, 290, 300 pounds that are fast and agile and strong. And I can't even imagine what it must feel like to get hit by one of those guys at full speed. Trust me, those helmets and pads can't be that good at protecting you. It's, you've got to be able to feel it. So there's 11 guys on one side and 11 guys on the other side. And they spend six days a week in preparation. They eat the right food. They go to the gym and they get muscles. I mean, these guys are just, there was a guy on the, uh, uh, on Thanksgiving day, I had an opportunity to watch one of the games, the afternoon game between the Cowboys and the Washington football team. Make sure I get it correctly there. And there was a guy on the uh, Cowboys. I, I forgot his name, but he's a, he's a linebacker. And honestly, his neck starts from right, right below his ears. And it doesn't go down like a normal neck. His neck starts from about right here, and it just goes out. His neck was is just... Uh, I don't know, Van Merlin, I don't know what his name, it starts with some kind of, it starts with a V, but his neck literally, it just goes out. His, it's, it's just insane. His neck is about, is, is almost bigger than, bigger than my, my entire thigh. It's insane. And this guy is just a physical specimen and he's running around the field and he's smashing into people. You got 11 guys with power, but what's amazing is you've got a, Probably a 60-year-old, maybe somewhere in that 60-year-old fellow with stripes on, and he he's definitely not physically a specimen. He's definitely probably not based off their physical appearance. They're not in the best shape. They're not spending hours in the gym every day. They don't have the same muscles, and most of them are frail and look like if you hit them, they would break. But they're called the referees. And you know what's funny? The 11 guys on the field for each team, total of 22 guys who are stronger and have more power than all of those officials have to stop when one official blows the whistle. When one official blows the whistle, all 22 guys by rule are forced to have to stop. And in fact, if they keep going after the whistle is blown, they can get a penalty. So you have... 22 guys with power and one guy with the right authority can stop 22 men who spend six days a week physically training their body to have optimum performance. But one guy with a whistle and the right authority can stop the 22 guys with all the power and specimen of physical representation you can have. What does that mean? The means is it's not power that we need need more of. We don't need more power. What do we need? We need authority. And that's why the Bible says when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we don't just receive power, but we receive authority. Power's great, but if we're going to have power, Satan has power. But what he does not have if our power if our if if we're in connection with Jesus Christ, now, we, I'm not getting this today, but if you're out of connection with him, you're on your own. It's a whole nother, whole nother subject for another day. But if you're in connection with him, if you're submitted, we talked a lot, a lot, about, a lot about this over the last uh, six, seven months on Sunday mornings, and we've talked about it on Tuesday Talks as well. But if I'm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if I'm submitted to the Lordship, in fact, uh, we're, we're just rolling with Jesus this morning. This was not anything I am intended to do, but Jesus is in charge here. So he's He's in charge. So whatever he says do, we do. So he's, he's speaking this word to somebody. So we're going to jump on and listen to what Jesus is saying. 1 Peter chapter 5. Watch this. Here we go. Watch this. 1 Peter chapter 5 gives us a recipe to how to get in alignment with Jesus Christ. Watch this. It gives us the recipe of what I'm talking about. We're talking about the difference between power 
and authority. Because right now, some of us feel knocked down, but it's the authority that says we're knocked out. Remember, being knocked down is not the problem. Jesus got knocked down. All of hell celebrated the fact that when he got off that cross and said, it is finished, and they carried his limp, broken, bloody, beaten body off the cross after he got knocked down. All of hell was high-fiving, going, yes, we've won. But they did not realize that Jesus had only been knocked down, but he hadn't been knocked out. When Peter denied Jesus three times, all of hell cheered. In fact, we've got another victim. We've got another triumph but they didn't realize peter had been knocked down but hadn't been knocked out when paul was chasing people around killing them and he before he had his conversion experience hell thought there's a oh great we got somebody right now they've been knocked down but he realized they hadn't been knocked out you see the devil's trying to declare your end when he does not have listen to what i'm saying today i feel the holy ghost right now somebody needs to hear me the devil does not have the authority over your life to declare your end. In fact, we're going to go just the farther. I'm, oh, I feel Jesus right now. Someone needs to hear what's being said because honestly, I, if I could, if I could, I don't have any notes today. I felt like the Lord was going to take in one direction, but he has completely taken this in a complete different direction. And I'm, I'm in submission to him. So we're rolling with Jesus this morning. But listen to what I'm saying. There is still some of us out there that are still dealing with the fear of death. We've got COVID and there's still whatever. Again, I, I hate to get into COVID because uh, there's so many different opinions and there's so many people out there with different opinions and everybody seems, you talk to one person, they think it's no big deal. One person thinks it's a conspiracy. The other person is wearing a full rubber suit. You know, whatever, whatever part of the Whatever part of the, of the, of the uh, spectrum you land on today, that's your opinion. I will say I do know personally some very, uh, very, in fact, people that, that I know that I'm very close with that have, have gotten uh, and been very sick with COVID, but also know some men that I know. I don't know them personally as far as friendship, but I know them. I've met them. I've talked with them that to have died with uh, COVID uh, in the last couple of months. So again, not to make that statement to get into all that because I know some of you right now are ready to fire away on the comment box going, it's a conspiracy. Again, I'm not giving you opinion. I'm just trying to share with you a, a, a point. And that is there's still, especially in the beginning, I remember in the beginning, you could go out to the store and, and my wife and I, we would talk about this experience on Ride at Home. We would go out to the store and uh, this was in the beginning of um, of the real quarantine lockdown back in April. And you'd go to the store. I mean, I mean, we shop at Walmart. That's Walmart, Target is pretty much our stores, right? And especially Walmart. Was, you know, I know some of you. Walmart's not your thing, but you know, it's it's just well, again, it's I guess opinion. But we go to Walmart. You can play, I guess you can knock it, but. So in Walmart, man, it was like, you walked in there, the shelves were completely just destroyed. I mean, everything was taken. You, I remember for weeks there, you'd go into the meat department and there was no meat anywhere. And I remember one day specifically, uh, we got up early one morning, really early to, to be at Walmart. And we were standing out there when the door opened and we prayed before we go in, Lord, you know, we need some meat, Lord let there be some meat in there. And thankfully we had just gotten there. They had brought out some meat. It was only a small amount. So the people that were there in the beginning got it. But I remember in the beginning, especially back in April, and maybe you didn't experience this. And again, I think we all have had our own unique experience over the last eight months. So you might have experienced this and others of you may not. But I remember the feeling of fear was almost tangible in some situations, not everywhere, but I remember the feeling of fear was almost tangible because it was back then, we didn't really know what to expect. And there was a lot of us back then that were really battling with fear uh, over getting COVID. And the fact that if you got COVID, it, it, uh, it, it, it would potentially be a life threatening illness. And, uh, and uh, even though people are, are still passing away from it. I think the reality of it is we don't feel as life-threatening as we did. But in the beginning, it was very much that way. 
And uh, man, I remember the feeling. We would we would get in the car. We would pray God's covering over us before we went into stores. And and um, a lot of you, we told stories about you know when you would come home. I know some people that when they come home, they would literally take wipes and clean off every piece of grocery that they brought in. Every box was cleaned. Every time they got a Amazon box, they'd clean it, spray it off. I mean, there's people walking around with masks on and gloves on, and it was. It was a really like tangible feeling of fear. Now I can't speak for anybody else. I, I, and again, this is not a judgmental statement at all. I'm not judging someone's eternal destiny by making this statement. I'm simply stating the facts of the word of God. As a believer who has been baptized in the name of Jesus, and again, there's a whole nother subject for another day, but if you don't have the name applied to you, the name is where the authority is. There's no authority and a title. There's only authority and the name. So when you have the name of Jesus called over you in baptism and you are filled with his spirit, you do not walk in subject to this world systems. Yes, does that mean you are above everything? It does not mean that. Does that mean you'll never have issues? No, but here's what it means. The Bible says it's been appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The hard problem we have sometimes in understanding God is in understand that God holds, God and God alone holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Now, I understand that that opens up another side of, of, the, of the argument because some of us go, well, if that's the case, then why did he let so-and-so die? And why did he take my father, my mother? Why did he take my child? Why did he take my brother, my sister, my friend, my uncle, my grandfather, my grandmother? That's another issue. I think part of that issue comes from the fact that we're very temporally minded. We're very temporally minded. We are consumed with the temporal. And ultimately, you know what's amazing? That's a recent thing. If you go back and you look at diaries and you read historical accounts from people's thoughts, whether it's written down in diary or transmitted through stories or whatever, they did not value life the same way we value life. Uh, and that's why you see in most ancient co uh, cultures, all the way back to like the Egyptians and even uh, times before that, they were fascinated with the afterlife because they did not value a long life like we did because life, the expectancy of life uh, was not there. But as we have changed and we have gotten more and more uh, inclined into an expectation of living into our 70s, 80s, and 90s, and uh, even beyond that, and science has increased and medicine has increased, and so disease is being eradicated, and they're finding more and more ways to treat and cure cancer. And there's a lot of awesome things that are letting people live longer because of that. That's increasing our desire to live longer. And therefore, if we don't reach that maximum age, we feel like, God, what's up with that? You didn't allow so and so to live, or you took away this person. Again, I think that comes from a different mindset than the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about the fact that it, to, to, have your, to have your mind set on things of this earth, you're, you're not going to have any hope because if you only look for things that you can see, there is no hope. But if you look at things which you cannot see, Romans talks about this, that you can have hope. And so the reality of it is this is that only God and God alone holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The Bible says it's appointed and a man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. God knows right now your expiration date. He knows it. He knows your expiration date. Nothing catches God by surprise. I don't care if you get in a car today, you're driving down the road, you get hit by a drunk driver and you die instantly. It doesn't shock God. God knows your expiration date right now. But the reality is, and I said all that to get to this point, and I was a little bit of a rabbit trail for a moment to help somebody understand some things about Scripture. But there's a reality of this is that in the beginning of COVID, especially in the very early stages of the quarantine and all this and all of the fear we were going through, there was this fear, this tangible fear that, man, death is all around us. But the reality of this is that, that death does not have authority over you as a child of God. I don't care today, and I'm telling this right now, I don't care if you've been diagnosed with cancer. I don't care if you've been diagnosed with stage four cancer. I don't care if you have been diagnosed with a disease or you have COVID or you have some other debilitating situation that is in your body right now that the doctors are telling you 
X, this is going to happen, and this is what's going to happen. And you can say, well, okay, well, then I've got three months, six months, nine months to live, or whatever it might be. The very fact is, is that they, a doctor does not have authority over you. A virus does not have authority over you. Cancer does not have authority over you. The only thing that has authority over you, if you are filled with the Spirit of God and you're baptized in the name of Jesus and you're in submission to him, there's some qualifying things there, remember? Baptism. Spirit of God and in submission, in conjunction. We're going to read it in just a second why that's the case. If we have those three criteria met, then ultimately nothing has authority over us except God. So that means whatever is going on in my life is not meant to destroy me, but God is using it or doing something in me through the trial and situation. And I may be knocked down, but I'm not knocked out. Now let's look at this again, because Paul, Peter kind of gives us this understanding, and I want you to see this, how it, how it plays out here. Watch this. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 6 says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now notice this. It first starts with humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. What is that? That is what we talked about numerous times through the last eight months and on Tuesday talked. That is submitting yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Meaning that I'm not segregating my life out from the natural and the spiritual, from church and work and play and family. That every aspect of my life, everything in my life is subject under his authority and his direction. That I'm in his, I'm under him. So it's not just God, I want you to be the Lord of my life in my spiritual world, but God in everything that I do, from where I go to work, from where I who who I marry, to where I where what 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 career, what my dreams, all of this I want it to be in submission to your lordship. And Peter said the first thing we've got to start with is humbling ourselves under the mighty under notice that humbling ourselves under under is implying a a sub of subordinated position, a position of subordination, a position of, of submission to a higher authority. So I humble myself, and notice this, he says you have to humble yourself. So number one, submission is a choice. It's not just an act, it's first of all a choice. You, I can't submit you to God, you have to submit yourself. And Peter says make the choice to humble yourself under the mighty hand or the supreme authority of God, and he will exalt you in due season. Notice this, in due season, in due time, actually, he will exalt you in due time. What is that referring to? Time. Who controls time? The only person in scripture we can find that controls time or who is superior to time is God. I've heard people argue, well, you know, God's, God, is, God is subject to time. If that's the case, if God is subject to time, then time is ultimately the superior being of the universe. But the Bible says that's why God says, I declare the end from the beginning. That's why the Bible says a thousand years as is a day and a day is a thousand years. Because God wants you to know that he is superior to time. But if we are under his authority in our life. We've submitted ourselves under his authority and he is the Lord of our life. That's why the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. That doesn't mean that that's the only step to salvation, but a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord of our life. Romans says that. Acts says it. If you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, what does that mean? I need to confess. I need to speak out and submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. That's the first step I have to take in order to step into the process of salvation, into the process of redemption. I have to establish that He is my Lord, that He is the Lord of my life. So Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's, sub, sub, that's submission to his lordship. And he will exalt you in due time. What does that mean? That his will will be the thing that controls my life. Again, God is the one that controls timing. So if I, he exalts me in due time, in due time means it's his timing, not my timing. What is that? 
That's called the will of God. The will of God is not only the direction for my life, but the timing of my life. A lot of times we know direction, but we don't know timing. So when I start off with humbling myself under the mighty hand of God, which is submission to his lordship, then he will exalt me in due time, meaning he will bring me to my expected end or my expected result through his will. Now watch this. What's the next step? We've talked about this. In fact, I ministered about this several months ago on a Sunday morning. Here's one of the things you have to do. Once you've submitted to his lordship, once you have come under the, uh, under the, 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 the direction of his will in your life, then casting all of your care upon him for he cares for you. Meaning once you acknowledge that he is the Lord of your life, that he is the, the one that's the authority over you, and then you come in, come in submission to that authority, and now that authority is over you, you have that authority, and now that you walk in that authority, you know that everything in your life is in due time. Why would you want to carry anything? Why would you want to hold on to anything? Why would you want to be the thing? The, why would you want to hold on to worry or doubt or fear or uncertainty or brokenness or shame or anything else that you're carrying? If you truly are submitted and you are under his authority and you understand that you are now in his perfect will and the timing of his will, then that means I want him to have everything because everything that I hold on to keeps the due time from coming to pass in my life. Because God can't bring due time if I'm the one in control trying to control the outcome and the time. Now, I need somebody to listen to me. There's some revelation that's coming to you today. God's trying to help somebody. You're knocked down, but you're not here. You're not you're you're not knocked out. But here's some steps you've got to follow. Submission to his lordship. Understanding and being in conjunction with his will in the due time of his will. And thirdly, once those things are accomplished, then everything that I'm carrying, whether it's fear of COVID, whether it's financial fear, family fear, family situations, health, uh, life, dreams, future, past, present, whatever it is, I want to cast all of that upon him because I'm acknowledging by casting my casting is in conjunction to the acknowledgement of his lordship and understanding that it's his due time. So you know what? I want something. I, if I'm sick today, I want to be healed. Nobody wants to be sick. Nobody volunteers and say, you know what? I don't feel great today, but that's okay. I want to be sick. But when I'm sick and I say, Lord, I cast this sickness upon you, I'm acknowledging to him that he's the Lord of my life, that he's the supreme ruler of my life, that he's the one in charge. And by giving him the sickness, I'm giving it back to him, which basically says, Lord, it's your due time. If you heal me today, I'm going to give you praise. But if you allow me to live another day sick, I'm still going to give you praise. God, I give you this cancer. If you choose today to eradicate every cancer cell, I'm going to give you praise and glory and honor because I'm walking in your will. But if you choose to have me continue to walk this journey of cancer, I'm still going to give you praise and glory and honor because I know it's in due time. Lord, I give you my relationship with my husband, my wife. I give you my children. I give you my parents. I give you my job. I give you my boss. I give you my financial future. I give you my dreams, my visions, my hopes, my desires. I give it all to you. And if you change it, great. But if you don't change it, I'm confident because I'm in your will and I'm walking with you. Now watch this. We talked about eventually, we started off talking about power and authority. We started talking about being knocked down, but not knocked out. Watch what happens. Once you do those things, I want you to see the progression here this morning. You have now submitted yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. You're not simply a church attendee. You're not simply putting in your religious obligation, but you desire to have God to be the Lord of your life every day, 24-7, 365, rain, snow, sleet, or hail. You desire to have him the Lord of your life. You're not just living a religious life, but you're walking with Jesus. You're not simply trying to follow the, the doctrines or creed of a religion or a church or a preacher or some ideology, but you're trying to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. 
Once you've established that, and now you're in understanding that you're walking in his due time, and now that you're giving everything to him, and you're casting upon him because you acknowledge that you cannot do anything without him, and that all of your attempts are futile, and there's nothing you can control, and just by trying to control something proves that you're really out of control, because you can't control something that is not in your control, and by trying to control something, it proves that you're acknowledging that you're out of control, and once you've cast all that upon him, now what happens? You would think, let's Woo, this is great. I've been, I'm under God's authority. I'm under his lordship. I'm walking in his will. I'm casting. Let's start a parade because Joel is about to walk into a, woo, this is going to be great. Oh my goodness. Let's get ready. I mean, heaven's going to break open the light. I mean, I got sunshine shining down here from the window here. That's going to be like my life, man. Everywhere I go, sun's going to shine on me right now. Look at that sun shining on them. I mean, I'm just going to have the light of blessing on me. Woo, this is going to be amazing. Blessing's going to shine down on me. God's favor is going to rain on me. It's going to be awesome. Watch what happens. Be sober. Meaning, be sober. Bring all of your thoughts into captivity. Don't, don't let your thoughts wander. Don't become intoxicated with life. Don't become intoxicated with the things of this world. But be sober. Stay sober. Stay focused. Be vigilant. Meaning watchful. Focused. Because here's why. When you acknowledge him as your Lord, and when you have now submitted to his will in due time, and you're casting on him, you need to not take and check out. Because here's what's going to happen. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. How do I resist him? Oh, I know how to resist him. I got to go into spiritual warfare. I got to start. No, no, no. Resist him. How? Resist him steadfast in faith. What does steadfast mean? I'm still standing. Woo! I know it's Sunday morning. I'm supposed to be calm and chill. But when I just, that just sometimes I just have to get it out. Steadfast in faith, that means I'm resisting him because I'm standing even though my body, my mind, my weariness, my doubt feels like everything around me is going around. I'm declaring that I'm still standing steadfast in faith because he has a power, but because he, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You've got power, devil, but you don't have authority. Oh, somebody needs to hear that because you've been lied to. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. The devil is just taunting you today, telling you how much of power he has. But today, he doesn't want you to realize that if you're in submission to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, you've got his name covered, called over you. You've got his spirit in you. And you're walking in his will that he does not have authority, but he wants you to think. One of the greatest tools the devil uses against you is to keep you from seeing who you really are. Because if you could ever see who you really are, you'll realize the devil can talk all he wants, but he can't win the war. He may be able to knock me down, but he can't knock me out. And the Bible says, resist him. How do I resist him? I got to stand in faith. I got to stand up. I'm still standing. I'm still standing. I'm still standing. But by the grace of God. You didn't realize today, if those of you that sang along with the song a few minutes ago, you didn't realize you were obeying scripture when you were saying, I'm still standing, oh, I'm still standing, I'm still standing, but by the grace of God. That's faith. You're standing steadfast, knowing that the sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in this world, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The devil acknowledges the fact he can recognize your authority. And when you have authority, what's he want to do? He wants to roam around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to roar in your life. Roar in intimidation, roar in fear, roar in doubt, roar in depression, roar in everything else he can throw at you because he wants you to be subject to the power of the roar. But you know what? He may have a roar, but I've got a Jesus. Woo! Somebody needs to get up right now in your living room, just run a lap. 
Ye may, devil, you may have a roar, but I've got a Jesus. You may have a roar, but I've got a Jesus. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody needs to be encouraged today because you feel knocked down, but you're not knocked out. And you can let the devil and everybody else declare over you today that you're knocked down, but only Jesus has the authority over your body. Only Jesus has the authority over your spirit. And only Jesus has the authority over your soul. So God is always going to have the last word. So knock me down, but you can't knock me out. You can knock me down, devil. And you know what? Today, 2020, whoo, I've been on the mat a bunch in 2020. I've been knocked down. 2020 has been the fight of my life. And it seems like every time I crawl back up and I pull myself back up and I shake the cobwebs out of another uppercut, I shake the cobwebs out of another right cross that knocked me down to the ground and I shake myself and I stand back up. I am only have enough time to open my eyes to see another punch knock me down. But you know what? You can keep knocking me down but you can't knock me out. You say, well, that's just semantics. That's just, that's good bumper sticker talk. No, 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 no. That's the word of God and it's faith. And how do I know that? I know it because I am submitted to him. He is the Lord of my life. I'm walking in lordship. I'm not doing my own thing. I'm not running my own life. I'm not choosing my own will. I'm not trying to fit God in my life. I'm trying to get my life into God. I'm not trying to make God my accessory. I'm not trying to make God an accessory to my life. That I just add on. He's an add on to my life to enhance my life so I can have a better life with Jesus. So I just add Jesus on to the rest of the stuff. But he's really no different than my cell phone. He's no different than my whatever else I'm using to enhance my life. He's another accessory. I don't know about you. God is not my accessory. God's my source. God's not the thing that I add on to. He's my all and everything. If I don't have him, I don't have anything. But if I've got him, I've got everything. He's not an accessory. He's the source. But when I have him and I know that he is there and I've got him and I'm walking in conjunction with him and I'm standing strong in faith, understanding that greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. And I know that I am subject to the lordship of Jesus Christ and I'm submitted to him and I'm walking in his will and I'm casting on him. The devil can come around all he wants and roar. Roar one, roar two, roar three, roar four, roar five, roar six, roar seven, roar eight, roar nine. But you know what, devil? You can keep roaring the number nine because when Jesus stepped into hell, he took the keys to he death, hell, the grave. And oh, by the way, just in case you're wondering, he stole the number 10. You know, the, the Bible says that in the end, we're going to the, God's going to pull back the curtain and we're going to be able to see Satan. And one of the reactions we're going to do, the Bible says, is we're going to go, that's the guy. That, that's him. That's him. It's going to, it the Bible tells us that. It says that we're going to be amazed. It's not because we're going to go, oh, whoa. We're going to be amazed. Like literally that's, you know, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz when you pull back the curtain and you realize it's just a guy with a microphone. It's not as intimidating. We're going to go, is that really, that's... <clears throat> That's him. That's the guy that did all this. That's, that's who that was. But I, I guarantee you that day when we get there, we're going to realize, I don't know if the devil has fingers and toes. I don't know. I, I don't know. I do know he's not red with a pitchfork and tail. The Bible talks in very descriptive that he was, Lucifer was something of beauty. I mean, he had all these stones and lights and all this amazing stuff. But I guarantee you, when we get to heaven and Jesus shows us what Satan looks like, I guarantee you, you will not be able to count 10 fingers or 10 toes. It's at most, if he has fingers and toes, which I don't know if he does or not, it's only going to have nine because he can't count to number 10. So you know what today? You might be at the stage of your life where you feel like you are at your uh, number 10. You may feel like you are at the breaking point. You may feel like you have reached the peak, the moment where, oh my, I don't know if I can make it, but can I tell you today, can you declare you've been knocked down, but you haven't been knocked out? And in the end, when you pull yourself up by faith, by faith, you stand back up and you can declare today, I'm still standing. Devil, I'm still standing. COVID, I'm still standing. Life, 
I'm still standing. Problems, I'm still standing. Broken dreams, I'm still standing. Broken hopes, I'm still standing. Broken hearts, I'm still standing. Shattered life, I'm still standing. Abandonment, I'm still standing. Shame, I'm still standing. 2020, guess what? We're still standing. But by the grace of God. Can we declare that today? Can you just go around today for the rest of the day? And when you see somebody, you say, hi, how you doing? Oh, by the way, I want to tell you something. I'm still standing. Can that be our, de can I, can that be our declaration? Can we say it enough today until we start believing it? I'm still standing. I'm knocked down, but I'm not knocked out. Well, it's, life is tough. Yeah, you're right. I'm at, I've been at nine for a while. But you know what? He's at nine, but he can't get past nine. So you know what? For the last eight months in COVID, it's been nine, 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 nine. I go to bed. All I hear is nine, 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 nine. I wake up. All I hear is nine, nine, nine. I go to work, all I hear is nine, 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 nine. I come home, all I hear is nine, nine, nine. I'm sick of hearing nine, but I know that all he can ever do is just say nine. He can threaten me with ten. He can taunt me with ten. He can try to intimidate me with, with ten, but he can't count to ten. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can I tell you today that if you don't have the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, you need to lift your hands right now and say, Lord, I want to submit myself and confess that you are the Lord of my life. I want to bring myself in submission to your Lordship in everything in my life. I want your will to be the thing that governs my life. And I want to cast all of my cares upon you today because I know if I'm in in your will, I'm baptized in your name, filled with your spirit, walking in you, that I have the guarantee that you and you alone have the authority over my life, and I'm still standing. Father, I have spoken what you've given me to speak. I didn't plan any of this. This is what, not what I not what I had thought or felt for today, but God, you stepped in here today because you are aware of every person that's watching. You're aware of every person that's going to watch. And Lord, I know that you're speaking a word to someone today. You're trying to get them to see. Number one, you're trying to get them to humble themselves and to submit to you. Not so that you can be the Lord and, and King and to taunt us with your power and authority. But God, because the Bible says that your name is a strong tower that the righteous run into or save. So Father, today we run into your Lordship. We run into your authority. We run into your name because we know that in this world of threats, in this world of danger, that you and you alone are the only thing that's safe. And Father, right now, open our eyes that we can see and Lord, if we have not been in Lord in conjunction with your Lordship, if we have not had your name called over us in baptism, and we have not been filled with your Spirit so that we can walk in confidence to know that you are the authority in our life, I pray today that your Spirit of revelation would be spoken over us today, that we can see and know and understand the desire you have to be the authority in our life. And that you desire to be our fortress. You desire to be our rock. You desire to be our stable ground in the midst of the sinking and shifting sand of this life. And even though 2020 has been absolutely the worst year for most of us. And we have dealt with so many problems. And it seems like it's never going to end. And we're going into a 2021 with the same thing that we've been dealing with, but God, we know that you have the authority over everything. You have the authority over COVID. You have the authority over life. You have the authority over health. You have the authority over everything. And we submit ourselves to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And by faith, we are sober, we are vigilant, and we are resisting Satan today by faith. And we are declaring in Jesus' name, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, we are declaring today that we are still standing by faith in you today. In Jesus' name, I'm still standing. Just say that the rest of the day. By faith, keep saying it. I'm still standing, but by the grace of God.